Well, good evening, and we welcome you to another edition of our online Bible study, Scripture Night in America. I am Pastor Steve Wagner, coming to you live from Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Lombard, Illinois. If you are watching us on April 17th, 2024, we are live. And, well, it does appear that I'm having some technical issues tonight. Uh, hi, Lori. Thanks for being patient, you guys. I'm trying to get it together. I, I think it's the camera itself. But uh, I've had to do a lot of scrambling at the last second. We've had a couple of glitches. But I think we're live, and I think you can see it. It might look a little weird and different to you the way you're looking at it, but it's what I had to do to get us online. So uh, we're working on it, but we're here. So I want to thank you for joining us. It's good to be back with you because it's been a little bit of a while since I've been live, and it's certainly been quite a long time since I've been here in our uh, plush television studio here at Trinity. I think it's been a couple of months since I've done that because we had – Lent in Parish Hall over there, but we are back now live uh, here in the room, and we're going to do our usual deal, where we take a look at the coming text for this coming Sunday, which should be the fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, I know we got a couple of people viewing, though I can't see exactly who they are. I know Lori's with us. Uh, if you're out there, say hi. Love to see you. Um, so we will do our usual deal, where we will begin by looking at our theme for this coming Sunday. And our theme for the text this coming Sunday is, we are totally dependent on Jesus for everything, even salvation. We are totally dependent on Jesus for everything, even salvation. All right, so in the season of Easter, we don't have Old Testament lessons. We have a first reading that is from the book of Acts, and our first reading today will be from Acts 4, and our gospel reading is from John 10, and so this is uh, actually otherwise sometimes known as Good Shepherd Sunday. So Jesus is going to be presented as the Good Shepherd. So we're going to take a look at Acts 4, John 10, and again our theme, we are totally dependent on Jesus for everything, even salvation. So our first reading, as we said, is from Acts 4, verses 1 through 12. So why don't we go ahead and put it up on the board and get started. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon the apostles greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes came together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All right. Annette, hi, Annette's with us. All right, um, so let's take a look at what we just saw. Okay, so it says that the chief priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, yes. excuse me, Let's 
so these are kind of the leaders of the uh, of the Sanhedrin. And the priests were there to lead worship. The captain of the temple was like the number two guy under the chief priest. And typically they were in charge of temple security. Now the Sadducees were an influential group within the temple. There was the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots. Those were the main groups, the sort of parties, if you will, that the Sanhedrin, the temple leadership was split up into. So these guys are all gathered together. Why? Well, the text said that they were greatly annoyed greatly annoyed because the apostles were pro proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. In other words, you're saved through Jesus and his Easter resurrection. Now, this would have upset a lot of people. This is kind of the story of the Acts and the, the book of Acts in the early church. The priests weren't happy with the preaching of Jesus as the Christ because it was contradicting what they were teaching because they were teaching that, hey, if you want to go to heaven, you got to keep us happy. The Sadducees were not happy with this teaching because the Sadducees, their kind of deal was they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, of anybody. So they're clearly going to be upset about the teaching of Easter and rising from the dead. That goes against all of their religious beliefs. So the apostles had been preaching and teaching what you would imagine would be uh, the norm, which is, well, Jesus' death on the cross paid for all of our sins, and the Father raising him from the dead proved that he was who he claimed to be, and we have victory over sin, death, and the devil in Jesus' death and resurrection. It's all about Jesus, the basic Christian message. That's what they had been preaching, but that message greatly annoyed the religious leadership at the time. John, thank you for joining us. I'm glad you're here. All right. Anybody else who's out there, say hi, please. I'd love to know that you're watching. Um, now, it says that it was already evening. Now, you've got to understand what had just happened before in Acts chapter 3. So, right before us in Acts chapter 3, Peter, given the given, uh, Peter was given the power of God to heal a man that had been crippled. Um, so, there was a man that was crippled. He was out in front of the evening worship service that they had every day. And this was like three in the afternoon. And so he performed this healing miracle in the name of Jesus, made sure he told everybody, hey, this man is healed by Jesus. Well, clearly that created an uproar. Well, the, Fer the priests and the Sadducees got mad. They wanted to hold them and to try them and to kind of shut them up. But it was already late in the day. you got to remember at this time, this was before electricity. So they didn't do anything after dark. In fact, they didn't do anything close to dark because once it was close to getting dark, it was important for you to get home so that you weren't out after dark, which was dangerous, wild animals and such. So 3 o'clock in the afternoon is too, early, too late in the day to deal with these people because it was already evening. Now it says that there was 5,000 people in the early church at this time. The early church was growing by leaps and bounds at this time. Uh, you remember in Acts chapter 2, there was just like a hundred or so people, and now just a short time after, there's thousands. Now, we're told about Annas, the high priest, 
and Caiaphas. So Annas is the high priest, and Caiaphas is a highly regarded priest who these two were held in very high regard, and they had authority in the temple. Now, Annas was previously removed from power by the Romans, but many of the Jewish people still recognized him as the leader. Uh, we're told about that in Luke 3, John 11. So, they approach Peter and say, by what power or name did you do this? Clearly, the miracle of giving a previously crippled man the ability to walk is going to create a stir. There's no question about that. Um, so these, now understand, these people that Peter is dealing with are the exact same people that authorized the execution of Jesus. These are the people who stirred up uh, the people on Good Friday, these are the people that were trying to appeal to uh, Pontius Pilate. These were the ones that are trying to get Jesus taken out. Now, what is what should be noted here, they don't really acknowledge the goodness of the miraculous healing. They're not concerned that a miracle has just occurred. What they're concerned about is the fact that Jesus' name being attached to this miracle is making them look bad. They're not worried about the truth. They're worried about their standing and their status because these guys sort of had set up this uh, system where they were in charge, they had the power, they had the authority, but they were teaching something and had set up this system where Jesus is God and Lord and repentance and faith in him is the way to heaven. That would have wrecked their whole system. So they're, they're actually ignoring this incredible miracle that's happened, trying to keep their political influence and power. Now, if you remember, these people confronted Jesus in the exact same way when he was teaching in the temple. By what power and authority do you do and say this stuff? And in unbelief, they actually accused Jesus of performing miracles by the power of Satan. That's Matthew 12. So these people have a history of not being concerned about what is actually true. They're just trying to hold on to their own power. And now it's happening again. So Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, it says. Peter talks to him, but he's talking to them under the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is crazy because Peter is declaring Jesus, proclaiming Jesus to the exact same group of people that had Jesus handed over to death just a few weeks earlier. Now, that is kind of amazing on one hand because that took a whole lot of guts. And two, consider how far the Holy Spirit has brought Peter in just a short amount of time because on Good Friday, Peter was even denying he even knew Jesus because he was afraid of the consequences. But now he's throwing caution to the wind. The same people that he was afraid of on Good Friday, he's declaring Jesus to be the way, which is, again, quite amazing. Now, by the way, Jesus had prophesied that this would happen, Luke 12, Luke 21. He said that they're going to have to deal with the same problems he had to. Nothing's going to change. Now, Peter makes the point, look, if we're being examined concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, And that's really the issue. Peter is kind of turning the tables on them 
and he's putting the focus on the fact that they were arrested for helping a crippled guy, essentially. Which is kind of hard to argue against. That's going to create problems. If this is all about us doing something good to a crippled man, now he here's where Peter gets down the business. He says it was done by the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, and whom God raised from the dead. So, he's very bravely and very boldly proclaiming Jesus is the power behind the miracle. And this is the same Jesus that you crucified, but God raised from the dead. All right, we've talked about this before, and so now that the text is here, it's worth mentioning again. If you've heard me preach and teach... um, either here at Trinity or online. I've talked a lot about a dynamic that Lutherans talk about a lot when you understand the Bible, and that is called the whole law-gospel dynamic. And that's a very Lutheran way of understanding the Bible. And what that basically says is, okay, God's Word contains God's law, which shows us our sinfulness and our need of a Savior, But then God's word also has the gospel. Forgiveness is found in Jesus. And so God's word through the law shows us our sin and shows us that we do need to be saved by God. But it also shows us that Jesus is the way by which we are saved. So Peter is being right in their face. Look, this is about Jesus. Jesus is the one who you crucified, preaching of the law. You guys put Jesus to death. He's not trying to shame them for putting Jesus to death, but he does want them to be convicted of the sinfulness of putting Jesus to death, not to shame them, but so that they can be forgiven. Because when the law convicts, we're like, oh goodness, we need a Savior. Well, then you come back in with the gospel that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, which conquered all sin. So Peter is preaching the law and the gospel of Jesus to the same people he was afraid of just a few weeks earlier. Now, Peter probably clearly understood that this message was not going to be well received by the audience, but he did anyway. Now, he says that Jesus is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. So Peter's quoting Psalm 118, verse 22, where the Messiah is declared to be somebody who would be actually rejected by the people. Now, again, Peter is quoting the Old Testament to a bunch of people who were Old Testament authorities. If you're going to try to make an argument for Jesus to people, and you're talking to people who are all about the Old Testament, it would make, Louise, thank you for joining us. It would make sense that if you're talking to Old Testament-minded people, If you can argue for Jesus as Savior and use the Old Testament to do it, that's going to be helpful. And by the way, Jesus did the same thing when he was here in Luke 20. Now, Peter ends his speech to the Sanhedrin with a verse that is very commonly quoted. And that is, there is no other name by which we must be saved. No other name under heaven by which we must be saved besides Jesus. No other name. Jesus is it. If Jesus don't save us, there's no other way. 
So Jesus is the source of healing for the miracle. Jesus is the source of salvation for our soul. So Peter is saying that not only does Jesus save, but he's the only way to be saved. Salvation is exclusively found in Jesus alone. Now, there's something else that's subtle here that's worth pointing out. Peter said that Jesus is the name by which we must be saved. So Peter is declaring that even the people listening to him, who are the ones that crucified Jesus, even them can be saved through Jesus by forgiveness. He said, we can be saved by no other name but Jesus. So he is preaching the gospel to them. He is, you know, anytime a Christian stands up against sin, and that's something we ought to do. We're called to do it by God. But even though somebody we may be standing up against sin, we're not doing it for the purpose to make people feel bad. We're not doing it for the purpose of trying to be self-righteous, uh, make ourselves better than other people. The whole purpose of the preaching of the law is always to have God create repentance in their mind and their heart. It's all about repentance, having a change of mind about our sin so that we can then be forgiven and be saved by the preaching of the gospel. Okay. So I have seen no thoughts or questions so far. So let's take a look now again at our theme in light of what we have heard from Acts 4. We are totally dependent on Jesus for everything, even salvation. So we saw that Jesus was the source of healing for the crippled man. And Jesus is the source of forgiveness, which gets us into heaven. Without Jesus, we ain't going to make it. That's what this is about. And you saw that in Acts 4. Peter clearly declared that. Okay. So our gospel lesson comes to us from John 10. And again, it's the old um, Good Shepherd text. We're going to split it up into two parts, John 10, verses 11 through 13 and 14 through 18. So let's go ahead and put the first one up on the screen and take a look at it now. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Okay. So Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. All right, now in the first place, Jesus said, I am. That ought to be kind of a buzz phrase for you. This is one of the seven so-called I am sayings by Jesus in the Gospel of John. Now, I am goes all the way back to Exodus 3 when God was talking to Moses in the burning bush and God saying, okay, we're going to do this and that. We're going to set the people free. You're going to be my guy to do all this. Um... And Moses is like, well, wait a minute. What about this? What about that? What about that? One of the questions Moses asked, and this is Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. He asked, look, if the people, you're God. So if the people asks, what is God's name? When I tell them I've spoken to God, they ask, what is your name? What should I tell them? And God answered by saying, tell them that I am has sent you. So God said that his name is I am in Exodus 3. So every time Jesus said I am, Jesus is explicitly claiming to be God in flesh. All right, he said I am. He said I am the good shepherd.
So Jesus has used the shepherd to be a point of comparison to pastors or the church itself. But the title Good Shepherd is for Jesus alone as he only is the one good enough to meet God's standard of perfection as a shepherd. Now, the whole analogy of shepherd and sheep is also kind of unbecoming for us because the analogy is Jesus as our shepherd implies that we are sheep. And that's not exactly a compliment. Uh, sheep are notoriously, well, stupid animals. Uh, they are completely and totally helpless on their own. A sheep cannot do anything without the shepherd. And so here's our theme of total dependency on Jesus. Uh, with him being our, our shepherd and us as sheep, he is establishing that we are completely dependent on him for everything. Now he says that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A normal shepherd is not going to lay down their life for the sheep. A hired hand isn't going to do so either. So Jesus' love for the world led him to do exactly that. So he's a little bit different than the rest. Now, the idea of Jesus laying down his life for the sheep is a direct reference to the coming cross of Good Friday. He's going to lay down his life, which makes him different. Now, he says that he's not a mere hired hand because, you know, in a, in a shepherding situation, the shepherd is going to be a little more invested in the well-being of the sheep than a mere hired hand. Well, Jesus is calling himself the shepherd well, the hired hand is Jesus referring to the religious leaders of the day, the priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. It's a little jab at them. Now, he says, he talks about how the hired hand reacts when they see the wolf coming. So again, the coming of the wolf A wolf intends to do harm and to destroy the flock of sheep. It is the shepherd's and the hired hand's job to defend the sheep from the wolf. A hired hand ain't going to do so good at it because a hired hand is like, oh, that's a little much for me. I'm not going to risk my well-being for these foolish sheep, though a shepherd would. Now, the wolf that's coming, is a reference to one who would try to destroy the flock. The flock, of course, is the church. So the one that would try to destroy the flock would be A, false teachers, teaching salvation in some other way besides Jesus alone. And, of course, the ultimate wolf is Satan himself. In Matthew 7.15, Jesus compared false teachers to wolves. So it's all kind of tying in together. Now he says that the wolf snatches and scatters them. A wolf does to a flock of sheep what Satan and false teachers want to do to the Christian church. Break it up, destroy it, scatter it. So Jesus is talking about how a hired hand is not going to really work too hard to defend sheep from a shepherd because he's not worried about them. As he says, he's a hired hand, he cares nothing for the sheep. cares 
nothing for the sheep. So Jesus is saying that the religious leaders of that time are only concerned with themselves and their power instead of the spiritual well-being of the people. He's absolutely calling them out right to their face. And again, these are the same people that Peter was declaring Jesus to in Acts chapter 4. All right, so Jesus has got a really good analogy going here. All right, so we can finish up by seeing what God is talking about here by looking at John 10, verses 14 through 18. So let's put that up. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Okay. So Jesus says, I know my own, and my own know me. We only know Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of the difference. If somebody does not have the Holy Spirit, they're not going to know Jesus. We are Jesus' own because we have the Holy Spirit. We are repentant. We have faith. And all that comes through the Holy Spirit. So he says, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So the relationship between God the Father and God the Son is one of complete oneness. And Jesus compares that oneness to the relationship of those who have been saved. Those who are children of God are one with Jesus, just like Jesus is one with the Father, which means that those who have been saved by Jesus are one with the Father, one with God. Communion with God. Now, he made an interesting comment when he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. The other sheep he's referring to are the Gentiles, because many of that time, especially amongst the religious leaders of the day, felt like if you wanted to be saved and you were going to be right with God, well, you had to be Jewish. The whole Gospel of Luke talks about the fact that Jesus died and rose for everybody, not just Jewish people. And Jesus is saying it here. Jesus is proclaiming the universality of salvation in him. In him. It's, he's not only the only way, but his way is for everybody. Um, he says, speaking of the Gentiles, they will listen to my voice. So today we hear the voice of Jesus through his word and we are able to listen and follow by the Holy Spirit. So the ability to listen to Jesus' voice is the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that will not just be for Jew, but Gentile as well. And he says they will be one flock under one shepherd. Salvation in Christ is a unifying force that gives God's people sort of a oneness under God. Um, 
in the sense of Jew and Gentile, Jesus is saying that ethnicity isn't going to be a divisive factor because uh, in Christ, he unifies and becomes one even across ethnic borders, but it's not just about ethnicity. Jesus unifies and makes one regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of economic status, regardless of social status. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, the Holy Spirit makes us one in Christ. And he says, for this reason, the Father loves me. Jesus' death and resurrection as a way of eradicating sin was the Father's plan for salvation. Jesus was willing to execute it on the Father's terms and did execute it on the Father's terms. Therefore, God the Father loves him because Jesus was the way that all people were saved. Now he says, I may lay down my life that I may take it up again. Obviously, the laying down of Jesus' life was Good Friday's cross. That was the Father's plan. But he wasn't going to stay dead. Easter is Jesus taking up his life again. So, Jesus died on Good Friday. He was raised from the dead on Easter Sunday. And that is how we are saved. Now, he made the point of saying no one takes it from him, but he lays it down on his own accord. Jesus went to the cross by his choice because Jesus loves you and Jesus wanted you saved. Nobody made him go to the cross. He did it because it's what he wanted to do. He was not coerced. It was not against, done against his will. It was done out of pure love for you. Barb, good to know that the seniors are equal in God's eyes. They are. They're, every, it, Jesus is the great equalizer in a world that likes to have haves and have nots. There is the levelest of level playing fields amongst all people in Jesus. The good news is that no one has an advantage or a disadvantage when it comes to dealing with Jesus. And that is good news. Now, he talked about having the authority to lay down his life and take it up again. Jesus, yet again, is claiming to be God because to have the authority to do this, only God has the authority to do this. Once again, he is, in fact, claiming to be God. All right. So we have Acts 4, which has Peter declaring Jesus to the Sanhedrin. We have John 10, where Jesus is declaring himself to the Sanhedrin under the um, teaching of the Good Shepherd. So let's kind of put this all together and review how this relates to our theme for the night. We are completely unable to survive physically and spiritually without Jesus. Jesus has given us earthly life. Jesus provides for all of our needs of body and soul. And we are saved only through Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, Peter, in the face of dire persecution for his faith, declares Jesus as the power by which the healing miracle in Acts 3 happened. And he proclaims Jesus as the only means to salvation to a very hostile audience. John 10 is where Jesus tells us that he is our good shepherd and describes all that he does for us, motivated by his love. And we thus, as sheep, see how necessary Jesus is for us to be saved.
All right. That's a wrap. I uh, was, we were able to overcome the uh, technical glitches that got us off to a rocky start. It looks like we made it through without uh, things going terrible. I thank all of you for joining us once again. It's always a pleasure to be here with you live on Wednesday nights. I have to admit, I have missed being here streaming from our conference room. It's been a couple months. But uh, we are here live tonight. We're going to be live for at least the next two weeks before we have some more interruptions. But as always, we will have Wednesday night content for you regardless. So we thank you for joining us tonight. We do invite you to join us, as always, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time, where we have a live-streamed uh, worship service from our sanctuary here at Trinity Lutheran Church. And we also invite you to not forget about our weekly live-streamed uh, chapel services for the opening of school on Wednesday mornings at 8.30 Central. And don't forget to join us next Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Central for another live a uh, live streamed edition of our weekly adult Bible study here. So I thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon, either in person if you're here in the area or online. Thanks again for watching. If our video has been a blessing to you and you think other people might benefit from it, please feel free to share. Tell others about our video, spread the word. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, later this weekend on Sunday for worship and Wednesday for Bible study again. I pray the Lord would very richly bless your evenings.